Welcome to the deep dive. Today we're uh, tackling the big winter forecast everyone's talking about, the yeah. NOAA winter 2025 outlook. And it's painting this picture of, well, dramatic contrast. They're calling it a tale of two winters across the U.S. So our goal here is to really break this down, figure out where you might fall on that spectrum, you know, warmer or colder, wetter or drier. And we want to understand what's driving the split. There's a specific climate pattern involved and maybe touch on how this fits into the uh, the bigger picture of climate change. Yeah, and that contrast is really striking. This forecast is from NOAA's Climate Prediction Center looking at December through February. And what jumps out is this clear divide. They're pointing towards cooler, wetter conditions for like the northern and western parts of the country. Yeah. But then flip that completely for the south and east expected to be milder and drier. Really sharp difference, almost textbook, which explains why planning for winter looks so different depending on where you are this year. Okay, so let's get right into those temperature trends. You mentioned that split. Where are we expecting the cold air to really settle in? Sounds like the upper Midwest, the Pacific Northwest. Those are the areas flagged for potentially cooler than average temperatures, which means for people there, maybe longer cold snaps, higher chances of snow sticking around. Exactly. That's the general idea for those northern regions. Increased probability of cold spells. And yes, if the moisture is there, more significant snow potential. But then head south of, say, the Ohio Valley or towards the East Coast. And it's a completely different story. Places like Texas, Florida, the Carolinas. The projection there is for warmer than normal temperatures. Okay, so milder days, maybe lower heating bills. Lower heating bills, definitely. But also uh, a much lower chance of seeing any substantial or lasting snowfall. Right, but you have to be careful with averages, don't you? That's a really crucial point. NOAA emphasizes these are seasonal averages for the three months, December, January, February. So what that means is, you know, you could have a month that feels totally normal, maybe December is average, but then maybe January and February are super warm and that pulls the whole season's average way up into that warmer category or vice versa for the cold spots. Ah, uh, okay. So the average hides the ups and downs within the season. Precisely. The volatility of those swings between mild and cold or wet and dry, that might actually be the defining feature, not just a steady state. That makes sense. It's not just a flat line. Okay, let's pivot to moisture then. Winter means thinking about snow, sleet, rain. What's the precipitation outlook telling us? Absolutely. And while NOAA doesn't give exact snowfall predictions, that's more short-term forecasting. The precipitation outlook gives us some pretty strong clues. So the areas looking wetter than average, they stack up mostly across the north again. Think Pacific Northwest, Northern Rockies, Great Plains, and the Great Lakes region. These spots are forecast to get above average precipitation. Now combine that with the potential for colder air. And that's your recipe for potentially heavier snow. That's the potential, yeah. Especially in areas like the Great Lakes, where lake effect snow could really get going if the conditions line up. Those systems can amplify things locally. Okay, more moisture up north. What about the other side of the coin? Well, the southern half of the country looks like it might miss out on a lot of that moisture. From Southern California, right across through Texas and into the southeast, that whole stretch is leaning towards below average precipitation. Below average precipitation and the warmer temps we talked about. Exactly. So the combination points towards generally drier, milder conditions overall. Maybe even concerns about dryness or drought in some of those areas. So the bottom line for planning seems pretty clear based on latitude. North, brace for snow, maybe icy roads. South. Think about dry conditions, maybe even fire risk. That's a good summary of the implications, yeah. Yeah. Very different preparations needed. Okay, so we have the pattern. Cold wet north, warm dry south. Let's talk about the why. What's the engine driving this pattern? You mentioned a climate driver. Right. The main driver behind this specific pattern is the El Nino Southern Oscillation, or ENSO. We talk about it a lot. And this winter's forecast fits really well with the La Nina phase of ENSO. La Nina. Okay, most people hear that and think cooler waters in the Pacific. But how does that actually cause this big split across the U.S.? Like, what's the mechanism connecting ocean temperatures way out there to weather in, say, Chicago or Atlanta? Yeah, that's where it gets fascinating. It's all about how the atmosphere responds. So La Nina means those cooler than average sea surface temperatures in the central and eastern equatorial Pacific. That temperature change, um, it actually shifts where major thunderstorm activity happens over the ocean. The atmospheric convection zones move. And that shift has knock-on effects on the big wind patterns high up in the atmosphere, like the jet streams across the entire hemisphere. The jet streams, okay, those steer our weather systems, right? Exactly. 
So with La Nina, what typically happens is the atmospheric pressure changes over the Pacific. This tends to push the polar jet stream, the big one, bringing cold air down from the Arctic into a sort of dipping pattern. It often dives south over the Pacific Northwest and across the northern tier of the U.S. That opens the door for colder air and direct storms across those northern regions, the Rockies, the Plains, the Great Lakes. Okay, so the polar jet dips south, bringing the cold and wet to the north. What's happening with the south then? Why does it get drier? Great question. At the same time, the other major jet stream, the subtropical jet, which usually brings moisture up from the tropics into the southern U.S., often gets weaker during La Nina. Or it shifts further south, sometimes basically missing the southern states altogether. It gets kind of blocked by persistent high pressure. So you end up with the north getting hit by that active, dipping polar jet, while the south is starved of moisture because the subtropical jet is weak or pushed away. That's the physics behind the tale of two winters. That makes a lot of sense. It explains why La Nina is such a reliable indicator for this kind of north-south divide. But here's the tricky part. This is a short-term pattern, La Nina. How does it interact with the, uh, the much bigger long-term trend of climate change? Things are warming up overall, right? Exactly, that's the crucial context. La Nina is operating within a climate system that is fundamentally warming, and the data is pretty clear. Sources like NOAA and the EPA confirm the U.S. has been warming season by season since the early 1900s. But interestingly, winter is actually warming the fastest compared to other seasons. Faster than summer, wow. Yeah. We're talking about winters across the contiguous U.S. warming by roughly 3 degrees Fahrenheit, that's about 1.7 Celsius over the last century or so. And the recent warming has been particularly extreme. Just think back to last winter, 2023-24. NOAA data showed it was the warmest winter on record in 130 years. Over half the states experienced record warmth. 3 degrees average warming is huge, but it feels like we're seeing more wild swings too, not just steady warmth. How does that fit? We see these long-term trends, but then experience these like extreme short-term events. Like you mentioned, the South is forecast to be warmer and drier this winter because of La Nina. But didn't we see some really disruptive, heavy snow down there just recently? I think it was January 2025 in the source material. You're right, and that highlights the conflict, the real challenge. The long-term trend is warming. The seasonal La Nina pattern suggests warm dry for the South, but that doesn't completely rule out short, intense bursts of winter weather. That January 2025 snow event in the south was likely caused by a specific short-lived weather pattern, maybe a deep trough or an atmospheric river tapping into moisture just right, hitting before the overall seasonal dryness really dominated. So La Nina sets the general stage for the three-month season, the tendency. But the atmosphere can still throw these curveballs, these high-impact, short-duration events. Which must be incredibly difficult for planning. You plan for the average or the seasonal trend, but get hit by the extreme outlier. Exactly. And we see the flip side, too. Think about the Northeast. They had that incredibly long snow drought over 700 days without significant snow in some places, finally ending in 2024. That wasn't just an inconvenience. It had real economic impacts on tourism, water supplies. And that climate central data you mentioned paints a concerning long-term picture for snow overall, doesn't it? It does. Nearly two thirds of US locations they track are getting less snow now compared to the 1970s. So the big picture is less snowfall overall, averaged out over decades because of warming. But within that trend, when the conditions do line up for snow or cold, the events can still be intense, even record-breaking, because a warmer atmosphere can hold more moisture. It's a paradox. Mm -hmm. Overall warming trend, but potential for more extreme precipitation events, whether rain or snow. Less snow overall, but maybe wilder when it happens. Okay, so let's bring this back to what people should do. How do you prepare for this specific winter forecast? Okay, let's break it down by region again. If you're in those northern states, Pacific Northwest, Northern Rockies, Plains, Great Lakes, the heads up is for potentially heavy snow and icy roads. So think about winter car kits, checking insulation, maybe having extra supplies, and also be ready for heating costs that might spike during those short, sharp cold snaps, even if the average temperature isn't record-breakingly low. Got it. Prepare for impactful snow and cold bursts up north. What about the southern states? For the south, the forecast leans towards mild temperatures, which sounds nice, but the big watch out is dryness. Below average precipitation plus warmer temps can mean increased risk of dry spells, potentially impacting water resources, agriculture, and raising the risk of wildfires, especially as the season goes on. So water conservation and fire awareness become more important. And travel. 
if you're moving between these zones. Yeah, that's a big one. If you're traveling, especially driving across that dividing line, say from the plains down into Texas or from the Midwest to the Southeast, you need to be aware you could be moving between very different weather regimes. Definitely keep a close eye on regional forecasts and road advisories. The conditions could change dramatically over a few hundred miles, particularly near those active storm tracks across the north. Okay, so wrapping this up, this NOAA forecast for winter 2025 gives us a really clear divide. Cooler and wetter, potentially snowier across the north and west, warmer and drier across the south and east. Right, and that pattern lines up really well with what we expect during La Nina. It's the classic signature. But the key takeaway seems to be that while the seasonal pattern is clear, we need to be ready for surprises. Exactly. The La Nina gives us the background tendency for the whole season. It helps communities plan resource allocation. Where do the snow plows need to be ready versus where does drought management need focus? But layered on top of that is the long-term warming trend, which adds energy and moisture to the system, potentially fueling more intense short-term events. So the average winter is becoming less and less reliable. Expect the unexpected within the season. Which really leads to a final thought, something for you, the listener, to consider. We know the U.S. is warming rapidly long term. We also know we're getting these extreme regional swings driven by patterns like La Nina. So if the whole idea of an average winter is becoming kind of meaningless because of these wild extremes, how should our cities and states fundamentally rethink planning? Things like uh, snow removal budgets up north or water management systems in the south. How do you invest for the future when the normal is constantly shifting and the extremes are becoming more common? Something to think about as we head into the season.